All right, let's talk about lung ultrasonography in critical care. It was long thought that uh, the lungs were just there to get in the way of uh, us trying to do an echo because um, there are these air-filled structures that are encompassing the entire chest, uh, standing in between the ultrasound probe and the heart. Um, and as we talked about in the intro lecture, uh, air is really good at diffracting sound waves. And when ultrasound waves are diffracted or scattered, uh, what we see on the screen is artifact. So it was thought that uh, this artifact was just um, a barrier to direct visualization of things underlying the lungs, like, like the heart. Uh, but then a very smart group of clinician sonographers um, led by a guy named Lichtenstein uh, actually looked more closely at these artifacts uh, and were able to um, correlate various artifactual patterns with uh, underlying disease states of the lung and, and thus was born sort of the modern art and science of lung ultrasonography, uh, in particular in critical care. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, with this talk. So um, here are the, the various applications for lung ultrasonography in critical care. Um, primarily, the purpose of ultrasounding the lungs is to figure out why your patient is in respiratory distress. Uh, why are they hypoxemic? Why are they not breathing well? Why are they decompensating on the vent? Why are their plateau pressures high? Those kind of questions. And, and these uh, questions can be answered very quickly using ultrasound. In fact, you can come to um, either rule in or rule out very um, high yield, very time sensitive diagnoses uh, with the ultrasound by the time uh, the technician, the, rad, the RADS tech can roll up the, the portable chest x-ray unit to your, uh, to your uh, bedside. So uh, very quick and very high yield. Um, and it can help you do things like guide your respiratory management. Um, oftentimes we you know, get these sort of uh, you know, semi-usable uh, quality, uh, semi-supine portable chest x-rays in the ICU and uh, we get just you know, these areas of white at the base of the lung. Uh, and uh, it's tough to say sometimes whether that white is uh, collapse, consolidation, effusion, or a combination of both. Ultrasound is actually really good at helping you differentiate uh, between those disease states when you see a pacification on the chest x-ray. And of course, it's very useful in guiding procedures. The way I used to conceptualize lung ultrasonography, at least when I was a fellow, was that I would use the probe to sort of construct uh, a chest x-ray for myself, uh, sort of interspace to interspace. And when I was done with my you know, my comprehensive lung ultrasound, I would picture in my head what the x-ray would look like. Um, I don't know if that helps you conceptualize it better or not, but it used to help me, you know, when I was learning uh, lung ultrasound. The specific things that we assess using ultrasound um, in the critical care setting, uh, and typically in this order, uh, uh, lung sliding, uh, pleural morphology, if you're interested in looking at the pleura and trying to identify pleural disease, lung aeration patterns, uh, the presence and character of pleural effusions, and finally, diaphragm motion. We're going to talk about all these things in sequence uh, as, we, as we go on. And these are some of the specific, uh, like I said, time-sensitive diagnoses that we can either uh, include or exclude using ultrasonography very quickly. And it turns out with a high degree of uh, fidelity. Uh, so things like pneumothorax, uh, alveolar interstitial disease, uh, atelectasis consolidation, again, like I said, effusions, pleural disease, and diaphragmatic dysfunction. Uh, ultrasound has been shown uh, and study after study to be very good at identifying these things and tracking how well they progress. And you know, these are just four studies, uh, referring to four studies that compared the utility of lung ultrasound in the ICU um, when compared with portable chest x-ray and with chest CT uh, in really looking for four things. One, to identify or exclude pneumothorax. Two, to identify aeration patterns. Three, to look for and characterize pleural effusions. And finally, when these disease states were identified to track disease progression and disease resolution. And it turns out that ultrasound was better than portable chest x-ray, these sort of you know, semi-crappy daily chest x-rays we get in the ICU uh, at, at doing these things. And it was almost as good as chest CT at doing these specific things. The advantage, of course, over chest CT is that long ultrasound is very quick. You can repeat as many times as you want without worrying about radiation risk and things like that and transporting the patient. And of course, it's, it's cheap. Um, so uh, a very powerful tool, very high yield tool, uh, especially when you're evaluating the patient who is acutely uh, decompensating from a respiratory standpoint. And I hope to demonstrate uh, the utility in these next few slides. So uh, let's go on to how to do the studies. As far as the transducer that you're gonna pick to do them, you have the option of either using the linear transducer or the phased array probe. Uh, my take is if you are 
uh, specifically and only interested in looking at lung sliding. So you just put in a line, you wanna make sure you didn't drop the lung. The linear transducer is your probe of choice because a linear transducer is better, demonstrably better than the um, phased rate probe at picking up, um, uh, looking at lung sliding and looking at pleural abnormality. So if you're interested in just the pleura, just at lung sliding, then use the linear probe. If you're doing a more comprehensive assessment, you're approaching a patient who is decompensating from a respiratory standpoint, and you don't know why, and you're using ultrasound to help figure it out, the phase array probe is better at looking at everything else, okay? And I will show you um, both at the bedside and, and, and uh, in this talk, how you can optimize the settings with the phase array probe to make it almost as good as a linear probe in looking at lung sliding, okay? So again, just interested in lung sliding, use the linear probe. If you're doing a comprehensive assessment for respiratory decompensation, I use the phase array probe. Okay, so most of the time, this is the probe I'm picking up when I'm going to do a lung ultrasound. Um, there's multiple schools of thought on how to actually conduct the scan. Uh, this is how I teach it. Um, I think, you know, just uh, concept conceptualize the chest here and, you know, do a couple of scan lines on either side. Okay, so first and foremost, you grab your probe. If you're grabbing the phased array probe, I use the abdominal setting. Uh, some machines and probes have the option of what's called a lung setting. Um, I happen to think that the abdominal setting is actually still a little bit better at looking at lung aeration and, and pleural effusions and diaphragm motion and things like that than the lung setting itself, but that's more of a subjective call. Uh, so I would suggest using the abdominal setting. You can try the lung setting and see how it works for you. Uh, but either way, everything that we do in lung ultrasonography is done in long axis. So like I mentioned before, the convention in body ultrasound is that long axis is with the dot up to the head. Transverse axis is with a dot to the patient's right side. So in this case, long axis dot up to the patient's head. And like I said, multiple scan lines. So I generally say do an anterior scan line sort of at the mid clavicular line and then do a lateral scan line at the mid axillary line on both sides. And what you're basically gonna do is you're gonna take the probe and go from rib interspace to rib interspace, sliding down as you go, looking at uh, the various things that we're gonna talk about in sequence. Okay. If you have a patient that can sit up, then you can also do a sort of a posterior lateral scan line as well. Uh, and that'll give you some additional information, especially if you're looking for fluid collections and, and uh, the best approach to drain the infusion. And these are the specific things, again, that we look for. Um, we, the way I teach is generally you start with lung sliding and you go on to looking at pleural morphology. The reason I uh, suggest that order is because um, there is a specific uh, way that you uh, optimize the settings on the phase ray probe to concentrate on pleural visualization and lung sliding, okay? And then when you go on to look at aeration, you're going to optimize the probe settings uh, a little bit differently, um, and it, it stays the same as you go on. So lung sliding, pleural morphology, you then go and look at the aeration pattern uh, on ultrasound. Uh, once you sort of get down to the base of the lungs on your lateral scan lines, uh, and you hit the diaphragm, you want to look for evidence of effusions. Um, if you see an effusion, you want to figure out, number one, is it there? Number two, how big is it? What type of infusion is it? Simple versus complex. And if I want to go after it, is it going to be safe or not? Okay. And finally, the thing that's often forgotten um, in uh, sort of general critical care setting is, is diaphragm motion. So we'll talk about all these five things. Um, and you can assess these five things actually very quickly. Uh, it doesn't take any more than about five to 10 minutes to do a thorough assessment uh, for all these things. And like I said, get a really, a really high, uh, high yield, very useful, uh, very time sensitive uh, assessment of the patient's respiratory status. So start by talking about lung sliding. So uh, lung sliding, you know, I think everyone sort of understands that the point of lung sliding is to assess for evidence of pneumothorax. Uh, so the idea is presence of lung sliding effectively rules out pneumothorax. So what is lung sliding? Lung sliding really is the visualization of the visceral and parietal pleura sliding upon one another as the patient breathes or as the heart beats, um, those pleural, uh, uh, pleural layers slide upon one another. And you can actually visualize that directly with ultrasound if there is no pneumothorax, okay? Um, if there is a pneumothorax, you cannot see lung sliding. So presence of lung sliding means the two layers of the pleura are approximated and there's no air in between them and you can actually see them sliding. So presence of lung sliding rules out pneumothorax. Absence of lung sliding, uh, unfortunately, is not that specific, okay? It can mean a number of things. It can mean you have a pneumothorax. Um, whether or not absence of lung sliding means pneumothorax will depend on your clinical 
for your patient's clinical pretest probability for having a pneumo. So if a patient came in with thoracic trauma, uh, say they got kicked in the chest by a horse, and you see absence of lung sliding, it's very likely going to be a pneumo, and you'd be on firm ground to act on it. Okay, but other things can cause lack of lung sliding as well. So hyperinflation, people have decompensated COPD, or people who are on very high uh, peeps uh, on the vent, uh, you can have absence of lung sliding. And anything that causes pleuridesis, so whether that be pleuritis from pneumonia, from ARDS, uh, or what have you, or therapeutic pleuridesis, obviously, uh, will stop the lung, uh, the pleural lines from sliding on one another. So all these things can cause absence of lung sliding. The decision as to whether absence of lung sliding means a pneumo, again, rests on your clinical pretest probability for pneumothorax, okay? Um, but there is one finding that is fairly specific for pneumothorax, and that's your lung point. The lung point basically is a ultrasonographic visualization of the transition point where you have approximated pleura and where the pleura are peeled apart by air. And we'll show you some examples of that, okay? So here is an example of normal lung sliding. Uh, so as you can tell, based on the shape of the field, this is a linear transducer. Um, and uh, I want to point out a few things on this. Um, so this sort of indicates how you want to frame your image. Um, you want to have a rib shadow on one side and a rib shadow on another, and you want your interface to be in the middle. Remember I said before that the highest resolution on the screen is dead center on the screen. So you want your object of interest, in this case the pleura, the pleural line to be dead center on the screen. So you're gonna to wanna to adjust your depth up and down so that this pleural line is, 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 is at the center of the screen. And like I said, centered left and right means having a rib on one side and a rib on the other, okay? So you can see that as this patient breeds, you can see that they're a bit um, but as the patient breeds, you can see that this pleural line here is sliding back and forth. So what you're seeing is you're seeing, again, the two layers of pleura moving, sliding on one another as the patient breeds. So that is normal. Oftentimes it's not very clear uh, in two dimensions whether there is lung sliding or not. So remember I mentioned that the best way to look at something moving over time is to use EMBO. Uh, so if you're not sure, and sometimes when patients are on the vent, uh, the lung sliding itself can be pretty subtle. Uh, so if it's not clear, use EMBO. So what you basically do is you will take your uh, picture here, again, rib on one side, rib on the other, plural line in the middle, uh, both up and down and left and right. You're gonna turn on M mode and you're gonna put your M mode line right down through uh, that plural line. Okay, so what we're seeing here is basically a cut through a cut. This is your plural line right here. This is all the stuff that's superficial to the plural. This is all the stuff that is deep to the plural. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing relative motion deep to the plural versus superficial to the plural. So this is moving in relation to this, which means the lung is sliding. This looks different from this because this is moving and this is not. Some people call this the seashore sign where up here is the sea, here is the shore with the sand. Um, so, but basically this looks different from this because there's relative motion here. So that is normal lung sliding on M mode. Here's an example of absence of lung sliding. So. Uh, we've switched probes here, so you can see now this is a phase array probe because you have this sort of conical shape of your field, but the same sort of um, principles apply, rib on one side, rib on the other, a little bit off center, but still rib on one side, rib on the other, plural line about centered on the screen. I'd probably reduce my depth a little bit just to get the plural line a little bit more centered. And here's the plural line here. So what we're looking for is we're looking for that same sort of sliding of that plural line, and we're not seeing it. We're seeing the whole sort of lung, the whole patient move. There's translational movement there, as you can see right there, but there is not that distinct sliding of that plural uh, interface there. So this is lack of lung slide, okay? Uh, again, if it's unclear on two dimensions, use M mode. You can use M mode with your phase array probe as well. It'll be the same idea, centering the plural line, okay? Putting your M mode right down the middle. And we see here, as compared with our seashore sign, um, here's the plural line here. You can see though that this stuff that's deep to the plural line is, looks about the same as this stuff up here. So there's no relative motion deep to the plural versus superficial to the plural. This looks the same as this. Some people call this the stratosphere sign because uh, there's you know, stratification of you know, the various layers of the atmosphere or 
barcode sign. I think barcode sign makes a lot more sense. Whatever it may be, this looks the same as this. No relative motion, so no lung slide. Like I said, absence of lung sliding is fairly nonspecific. Does not necessarily mean there's a pneumothorax unless your pretest probability for pneumothorax is high. Um, but if you see this, this is called a lung point. This is fairly specific uh, ultrasonographic finding for pneumothorax. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing a transition point sort of right there between normally sliding lung and not sliding lung. So this is purported to be where the pneumothorax is beginning, the transition point between normal lung and pneumothorax. So if you see this, uh, sort of regardless of your pretest probability, uh, it is very, very likely that this is a pneumothorax and I would act on it. Okay. Next, let's go on to lung aeration patterns. So like I sort of talked about at the beginning, um, the lung is an air-filled structure. So when you alter sound and air-filled structure, what you get is a bunch of artifacts. Um, but it turns out that there are very predictable patterns of artifact uh, that can be visualized on ultrasound that can give you actually some very valuable information as to what's going on with the underlying lung tissue. So that's really what lung uh, parenchymal ultrasound is really all about, is recognizing various artifactual patterns. So there's a few artifactual patterns that are relevant to us. One is what's called the A-line pattern. And the A-line pattern either means normal aeration or it means pneumothorax, and we'll talk about how to differentiate the two. The B-line pattern is the pattern that you can see that represents some sort of interstitial alveolar disease. And then finally, you have what's called a consolidation pattern, uh, where now the lung is no longer aerated. So you're not seeing artifact, you're actually directly visualizing the lung. And you can see a number of other um, uh, findings that are sort of a constellation of findings for consolidation or deaeration of lung. So we're gonna talk about all these uh, in sequence. So first the A-line pattern. So the A-lines uh, are basically horizontal lines that are parallel to the plural line and they sort of go all the way down, uh, stacked upon one another down to the uh, deepest extent of the ultrasound field. So what these are, these are basically representative what are called reverberation artifacts of the plural line. So what's happening is you have the plural line which is a very hyperechoic structure and deep to that you have air. So the way that the processor interprets the pattern of sound reflecting uh, off of the plural line and then the sound deep to its scattering is that there is a reflection or multiple plural lines shooting all the way down to the edge of the screen. I'll show you examples of this, okay? So what that means is you have the plural line and deep to it you have air. But that air could be in one of two places. It could either be in the alveoli themselves, which would be normal aeration, or you could have air in the plural space which would be pneumothorax. Both of these patterns can cause A-lines, okay? If you have A-lines with sliding lung, normal sliding lung, that's normal aeration. A-lines without sliding lung, again, could be pneumo, could be a, bunch, a, a number of those other things. A-lines with a lung point, that's pneumo, okay? So here's an example of A-lines. You can see here, um, so now what we've done uh, I forgot to mention, when you're optimizing your settings on your phased array probe to visualize lung sliding, what you want to do is you want to, like I said, reduce your depth to bring the plural line itself to the center of the screen and centered left and right, of course, rib on one side, rib on the other. And you're going to turn down your gain so that everything else, almost everything else except for the plural line sort of goes away. And then that will make that plural line stand out that much more. And it, it'll make the ability to visualize lung sliding that much better with the phased array probe. Okay, when you're then going to look at lung aeration with the phase rate probe, you're going to turn up your gain just a little bit and increase your depth a bit so that you can get more depth of view. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at the plural line and then we're looking at A lines here. So here's the plural line, here's the one A line, another, 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 all the way down. And you can see that these are basically just reflections of the plural line shooting down to the edge of the screen. Now, you do have to meet a few other criteria in order to call these things A-lines. Number one, like I said, they have to be reflections of the plural line. Number two, the distance between the plural line and the first A-line is the same as the distance between the skin and the plural line. So this distance here is the same as this distance, as is the distance between subsequent A-lines. So it is a multiplicative sort of thing. 
So this distance is the same as this, which is the same as this, which is the same as this, and so on. Okay. So these are true ver reverberation artifacts, and these are true A lines. Okay. And the other thing is, if there is lung sliding, uh, you should be able to see that throughout. Okay. To some extent. So here is A lines. So if A lines are horizontal, meaning they're parallel to the pleura, B lines are vertical, they're perpendicular to the pleura. So these are pleural based abnormalities. So they originate at the pleura and they shoot perpendicular to the pleura all the way down to the edge of the screen, okay? Because they are pleural based, when there is lung sliding, the B lines themselves move as the lung slides. And then if a B line and an A line ever meet, the B line wins. So the B line sort of effaces the A line as it goes through. So you have to meet those criteria in order for what you see to be called a B line, okay? Um, and this is an artifactual pattern caused by lung that is largely aerated, but with some degree of fluid uh, or other sort of thickening within the architecture of the lung or within the air spaces of the lung, okay? So overall aerated lung, but uh, sort of um, uh, contaminated, so to speak, with, with fluid or some sort of thickening, some sort of disease, okay? Um, here are some B lines here. So pleura all the way up here. Remember, when we went from lung sliding, pleura centered, we increased our depth. So the pleura is all the way up here now. You see these vertical lines, almost like someone is holding a flashlight and shooting it down a dark and dusty hallway and moving it back and forth as the lung sliding moves. Those are, these are all your B lines here. One here, one here, one here. You can see as the patient breathes, uh, the B lines themselves also move. So these are B lines. And B lines indicate some sort of alveolar interstitial disease. And we'll talk about the differential, but there is a continuum of B lines. Um, so we, I think there's up to seven B line types that have been identified. Uh, in clinical practice in general, we use two of them though. Uh, they're what are called B1 lines. So B1 lines are uh, sort of multiple, really thin individual B lines. Um, and these are representative of uh, thickening of the interlobular septa of the lung. So the actual sort of interstitial ar uh, architecture of the lung tissue is thickened either by fluid, like with pulmonary edema or pneumonia uh, or uh, fibrosis, other sort of connective tissue. Something is causing thickening of that of those interlobular septa. Okay. So if you see B1 lines, you're dealing with a primarily interstitial process. B2 lines are sort of more severe on the continuum of B lines. So instead of seeing these sort of multiple thin B lines, what you get are sort of coalescent B lines that are very thick. Um, and you may see like two or three really thick ones uh, in, an, in, an, in an interspace. And what these represent are, in addition to an interstitial process, you now also have an alveolar filling process as well. Uh, so not only is there fluid or thickening of the interstitial uh, sort of spaces, there's also fluid or some sort of filling going on in the alveolar space. Okay. So these are not necessarily mutually exclusive per se. Uh, it's not to say that B2 lines and B1 lines are separate entities. Rather, they are points along a continuum, suggesting severity and suggesting progression of disease. So for example, uh, if you have diffuse B lines, one of the, the items on your differential diagnosis is uh, pulmonary edema, hydrostatic pulmonary edema. So for example, if a patient comes in uh, who is hypoxemic and breathing hard and uh, placed on CPAP or BiPAP, for hypoxemia, for pulmonary edema, uh, you do a lung ultrasound on them, they're gonna have, you know, just sort of diffuse B2 lines. You'll diurese the hell out of them for, you know, 24 hours. They get a couple liters off, get them off of BiPAP, put them on some simple oxygen. You'll go and ultrasound them again, they'll have B1 lines. They aggressively diurese them even more for another couple days, get them back on room air, and you'll scan them again and you'll see A lines. So it's sort of a progression of severity of disease rather than uh, a black versus white. Okay. So here are, are some examples of B1 lines. You can see that these are thin individual B lines that you can actually count. Um, this is more of an interstitial process. Here are B2 lines. You can see these are thick coalescent B lines. And this indicates an alveolar interstitial process. Okay. Just like any radiographic finding can be diffuse versus focal, B lines can be diffuse versus focal. And of course, you know, they would sort of help you in your differentials. Of course, diffuse B lines would suggest some sort of diffuse process. You know, your primary differential is there, you know, so like I said, um, hydrostatic pulmonary edema or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from ARDS, um, trolley, 
alveolar hemorrhage can cause B-lines as well, fibrosis, any other sort of interstitial lung disease can cause uh, diffuse B-lines. Focal B-lines will be caused by a focal process. So anything that, again, causes a fluid or thickening in the interstitial and or alveolar space can cause focal B-lines. You know, so anything all the way from uh, atelectasis all the way up to pneumonia and infarct uh, can cause focal B-lines. Okay? So that's generally your differential for, for B-lines. Some sort of interstitial and or alveolar process uh, occurring in the lungs. The next uh, um, uh, aeration pattern that we uh, can identify is called the consolidation pattern. So the difference between the consolidation pattern and the A slash B line patterns are that with the A and B lines, the lung is still largely aerated. With the consolidation pattern, the lung is now de-aerated. So instead of seeing artifact when you ultrasound the lungs, you are now actually directly visualizing the soft tissue of the lung itself. Are you directly seeing the soft tissue of the lung? Some people call this hepatization of the lung because it oftentimes can make the lung look like the liver. Um, but either way, what you're actually seeing is you're seeing the lung tissue itself because there's now no longer uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of air in the lungs. Okay? You can also see focal B lines like I talked about. And you can also see what are called sonographic air bronchograms, which have the same implications as radiographic air bronchograms. Uh, and we'll talk about how those form and what those look like. And again, your differentials is anything that causes deaeration of the lungs, collapse all the way up to, you know, filling from pneumonia uh, or infarction or contusion. Okay. So here's an example of consolidated lung. So what we're looking at here is we're at the base of the lung. It's on the left side. So here's your diaphragm right here and the spleen slash stomach over here. And what we're looking at here, instead of seeing A lines or B lines, we're actually seeing something that looks like a soft tissue structure. Hell, it looks like a liver, uh, but this is actually lung. So this is lung that is now devoid of air. So you can see the soft tissue appearance of the lung. You can also see these white speckles, these white spots here. And these are your sonographic air bronchograms. So what's happening here is just like with uh, adelectatic lung and radiographic air bronchograms where you have you know, lung that is you know, white or pacified on x-ray, but you have these little areas, these terminal airways that are stented open with air and look uh, black on x-ray. This is sort of what you're seeing on ultrasound. So as the sound waves come in, you're visualizing the lung tissue here, this gray stuff. And then the sound waves hit these little areas, these little pockets of air. And when they hit these little pockets of air, the sound waves scatter. And that scattering creates this sort of white hyperechoic speckle looking appearance. So these are sonographic air bronchograms with direct soft tissue visualization, visualization of the lung tissue. So this is consolidation pattern. Here's another example of consolidated lung. You can see this lung is, you know, de-aerated. You're directly seeing the lung tissue here. Um, you're seeing some of that speckling as well. And you also have a little bit of an effusion, a little pleural effusion. Again, diaphragm uh, and liver in this case. And that brings us to our next sort of item of uh, evaluation with lung ultrasound, and that's looking for pleural effusions. There's generally three things you want to judge when you're looking for an effusion. One, is it there? Uh, so for example, if you're taking an x-ray and you see white at the base of the lung, is that collapse or is that is that effusion? Uh, so that's one thing that ultrasound is really good at helping you do. Is it there? And if it is, how big is it? Uh, so pleural effusion size largely on the you know acute care, critical care size is, is largely a qualitative assessment. So you look and see you know, how big it is by, by looking at how far non-dependent the fluid collection goes. You will find the fluid collection at the base of the lung, you know, sort of your uh, mid axillary line at the base of the lung. Uh, and then you will move the probe medial and superior. So towards uh, the, the, the center of the chest and also up towards the head. And you wanna see how far that fluid collection goes non-dependently. The higher it goes, uh, the bigger the effusion is. Um, the second thing you want to do is you want to look at the character of the effusion. So is it a simple effusion where the fluid collection is anechoic or black? Or is it a complex effusion? Are you seeing within the fluid collection itself? Are you seeing fibrin strands, evidence of cellular elements, septations, you know, that kind of thing, which would suggest a complex effusion. Okay. And finally, uh, from a practical standpoint, you're trying to figure out with the ultrasound, is it safe for me to try and stick a needle in there? Or you know, try and put a tube in there, okay? Is there an accessible pocket that's large enough um, and that's sufficiently 
distanced away from things you would not want to hit with your needle, like lung tissue, like diaphragm, liver, spleen, that kind of thing. And if, the, the most important thing is you want to assess that fluid pocket, both in inspiration and expiration. So you want to make sure that as the patient breathes, that fluid pocket that's sufficiently far away from, you know, lung and diaphragm and liver slash spleen uh, is persistent as the patient breathes in and out. So that's what you're judging using lung ultrasound. Here's an example of a small pleural effusion. You can see that there is consolidated lung here and there's a nice simple uh, small pleural effusion around it. As opposed to this, this is a large pleural effusion with consolidated lung. You can see this lung is tiny, it's deaerated, soft tissue appearance, sonographic or bronchograms with a large simple effusion. Uh, this would be, you know, safe to drain. And finally, here is a complex pleural effusion. You can see that there, there's a diaphragm here, and you can see that there's a fluid collection there with a bunch of little septations and, you know, fibrin strands and all kinds of complexity in there. Okay, so this may require, you know, uh, an actual, <clears throat> an actual chest tube, whether it be a small bore or a large bore, um, and maybe some more complicated management. So to recap, we talked about aeration. We talked about A-lines, how A-lines can either be normal lung if there is lung sliding, or it could be pneumothorax if there is no lung sliding. We talked about B-lines, interstitial alveolar disease. Uh, so B1 line suggesting more of an interstitial process. B2 line suggesting an alveolar plus interstitial process. And we talked about consolidation patterns suggesting deaerated lung. And of course, we talked about identifying and characterizing pleural fusion. The final thing we're going to talk about is something that people often forget, and that is the assessment for diaphragmatic function or diaphragm motion. Um, so if we look at how the diaphragm moves as the patient breathes in and out. So this is, again, uh, dot up to the head. So the head is up here, the feet are down here. You have the diaphragm here. You have the liver, kidney. And you can see as the patient breathes in, the diaphragm is moving down towards the feet. And it's moving medially. So inframedial sort of movement of that diaphragm as the patient breathes. Uh, so that's the motion that you're looking for, inspiration, expiration. The context within which you would uh, most often assess for diaphragm motion, especially in a general critical care setting, is in the patient who uh, you're trying to extubate. And for whatever reason, even after optimizing in every other sort of parameter you can think of, the patient still is not able to wean. They still keep, keep failing their SVTs. Uh, and one thing that you should look for in that patient, uh, that type of patient, is for evidence of diaphragm uh, dysfunction. Uh, of course, if you're doing posternotomy critical care or, or, or trauma critical care, the likelihood of diaphragmatic dysfunction is much higher in that patient population. And oftentimes we remember it more in that patient population than in the general uh, medical surgical critical care population. But remember, if you have a patient who's, who's not able to wean and you don't really know why, uh, look for evidence of diaphragm dysfunction. Okay, so like I said, you can look at this in two dimensions like this, just sort of directly visualizing uh, diaphragm motion. But remember, like I said, looking at motion over time, M mode is still uh, the, best, the best option. So what you could do is you could actually put your M mode line down through the diaphragm like that, trying to get as close to a 90 degree angle between M mode line and, um, and uh, the diaphragm line as possible. So what's gonna happen is as the patient breathes in and out, that diaphragm is gonna move along that M mode line and you're gonna be able to get a, a pretty good idea of what that diaphragm is doing uh, over, over time. So here's an example of normal uh, diaphragm M mode. So what we're doing here in this patient, this is a patient who is intubated um, but uh, and awake and alert, but still unable to be weaned off the vent and unable to be extubated, keep feeling their SVT. So what you would do is you would put this patient ideally uh, on a TP trial, some sort of negative pressure uh, mode or if you can't, in the very least, put them on minimal CPAP, like five of CPAP. And what you wanna do is, as you're visualizing the diaphragm, either with M mode or, or on 2D, you wanna tell the patient to take a deep breath in. So you can see as the patient breathes in, that diaphragm line is gonna move up. So you're gonna get this nice up and down movement of the diaphragm with deep breathing. Then you wanna tell the patient to do a sniff. And with a sniff, you should get this abrupt rise in the diaphragm and the drop there. So this is normal diaphragm motion in deep inspiration, expiration, and with a sniff. 
This is what a paralyzed diaphragm looks like. This is actually a unilaterally paralyzed diaphragm where the other diaphragm is working. You tell the patient to take a deep breath in, nothing happens. Um, and then when you tell them to do a sniff, you actually get paradoxic movement of the diaphragm. So instead of moving upward like it should, it's moving in the opposite direction. So what's happening is the other diaphragm is working, it's contracting, uh, it's, it's making the pleural pressure more negative. It's actually sucking the other diaphragm uh, along with it in the other, in the other direction. So this is paradoxic motion of diaphragm suggesting unilateral uh, diaphragmatic paralysis. Okay, so that sort of concludes all of the general content for the uh, comprehensive assessment with lung ultrasonography in your patient with respiratory distress, or hypoxemia. Uh, um, so just to sort of summarize, this is your differential diagnosis that ultrasound is really, really powerful in helping you determine. Again, looking at uh, ruling out pneumothorax, looking for evidence of pulmonary edema, uh, consolidation, which may suggest pneumonia, portal effusions. If your lung ultrasound is negative and the patient is not breathing well, that's like having a normal chest x-ray in someone who's hypoxemic. So you want to think of some of the other things that can cause decompensation. Um, so think about PE. In that situation, it may be useful to do an echo to look for RV strain, especially if the patient's unstable, or check for a DVT. Um, Bronchospasm, of course, maybe, you know, in the end, break down and take out your stethoscope and listen to the chest, listen for wheezing. Um, but it's uh, important to remember that normal lung ultrasound does not rule out respiratory uh, pathology. And if you're a fan of um, algorithms, this is a, a pretty good one. This is based on what's called the BLUE protocol, the Bed Lung Ultrasound Examination Protocol, which was published in CHEST in 08 by Lichtenstein and, and, and company. This is a sort of a um, a stepwise approach to using ultrasound in the patient who is in respiratory distress. Um, like I mentioned, start by looking at lung sliding. If there's no lung sliding, does the patient have a lung point? If they do, it's a pneumo. If they don't, you want to consider the pretest probability for pneumo. If the pretest probability is high, you're going to intervene on it. If it's not high, if it's you know a patient in the MICU you know, that's admitted for COPD exacerbation, um, then it, it may just be hyperinflation causing it, okay? If there are confounders, you want to go and look at lung aeration, which is the same as you would do if you had normal lung sliding, look at lung aeration. If you see diffuse B lines, think about your differential for diffuse B lines. Think about pulmonary edema. Um, is the hydrostatic versus non-cardiogenic? Maybe you want to do an echo and see if there's evidence of cardiac dysfunction or valve insufficiency or something like that that would cause, or diastolic dysfunction that would cause heart failure. If there is, then you would treat it as cardiogenic. If there isn't, then you want to think of all of your causes for non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, um, ARDS, you know, trolley, that kind of thing. If there's focal B lines or consolidation, think about your differential for focal B lines or consolidation, and then you're going to manage it based on your clinical uh, evaluation. If you have normal lung aeration, uh, normal lung sliding rather, and normal lung aeration, A lines everywhere, then this is, again, it's like having a normal chest X-ray in someone who is in respiratory distress or someone who's hypoxemic. So think about all the other things that could cause it. Maybe a good idea to do a DVT ultrasound. If that's positive, then very high likely that the patient has PE, of course. Um, if it's negative, think of all the other things, you know, bronchospasm, upper airway stuff could still be a PE, and then you could have had the DVT entirely embolized. Uh, think about right to left shunts uh, and, and things like that, okay? Um, Again, if you have questions, come find me uh, or there's my email address. I'm happy to, uh, to help out. And again, look forward to scanning with you.